As you're finding your way to Acts chapter 2, as we continue our DNA series, we're going to cross this great story. <clears throat> there was this city called Newport, Washington, and they decided that they were going to have a community Christmas tree in the town square. And so the day that they unveiled it, if you will, they kind of had a little ceremony. And people got there and they pulled the, the sheet or whatever it was off of the Christmas tree. And then all of a sudden in the crowd, you could hear this kind of collective, ugh, like a moan. It was bad. It was so bad that this guy named Fitz Turner, he decided he was going to do something about it, but like in a joking way. He, he, so he said, I'm going to start a GoFundMe page. He said, much like you do for someone who's sick and needs money or their car broke down, he said, I'm going to start a GoFundMe page, but it's really just kind of a joke. And in fact, even in the, the, the post for the GoFundMe, he, he took a few shots at the Christmas tree. He said, you know, we're trying to help our Charlie Brown Christmas tree. He, he said things like, uh, you know, we're trying to help bring this almost dead thing back to life. And here's what's odd about it is while he was doing it as a joke and just assumed nothing would happen, at least 60 people donated over $2,700 to it. And not only that, but people started sending private donations into the city for it, sums of thousands of dollars. Like any good director or president of the local chamber of commerce, he saw an opportunity, this other guy, to take advantage of it. And so he rallied all of this money, and he got all of these people together, and they had this big work day where they took all of this money and they decorated this tree and it looked like kind of the Northwestern's version of Rockefeller Center. It was beautiful. More so, he thought, you know, I think we can capitalize this even more. We had all these people come out to decorate it and let's get them together. Let's have a new unveiling. Not only that, but let's have Santa Claus show up and not only that, let's have hot chocolate and let's sing carols and let's do all of this stuff and let's just really blow it out of the water. That's an incredible story when we think about the power of community. We think about the power even of something as simple as a Christmas tree in the town square. People coming together, pulling their resources, their time, their talents, probably their ladders and extension cords, and making something beautiful out of nothing. It's just really incredible what people can do when they pull their time, their talent, their resources for a common purpose. The same applies to the church. We're talking particularly about Indian Springs Baptist Church this morning ourselves, but it's the truth of all churches. One thing we love to do here is we love to partner with other churches who preach and believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Like that's something we value because that's community. So when we do more together, we can accomplish more. We would agree with that, right? Well, the same is true in our own individual lives. In fact, I want you to see that. If you have your Bible open, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, stand with me as we read the words of God. And let's just understand this morning what it means to not just find community, but what does it mean to be in community? Hear now the words of the Lord, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who were believed, I'm sorry, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now look at verse 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the, the proceeds to all as they had need. Verse 46 says this, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. So Father God, in Jesus' name, help us understand in these next few moments what it looks like to be in community, to build community, really, God, to become community. God, we pray that we would see from your text the importance of needing other believers. God, that we would see from your word this morning that church is not an individual endeavor, but it's a team sport. 
So God, I pray that you would help us to weed out any preconceived notions, bad experiences, or thoughts that hamper our drive and our desire to be in community. Father, I pray that you would stand in my body, that you would think with my mind, speak with my tongue, all you would have us to know and to say and to do for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. When you start to talk about biblical community, when you start to talk about the idea of community, there is a lot of ideas that float out there. A lot of people will start throwing out words like it's friendship. Sure, community is friendship. Or it's accountability. Sure, it's accountability. But it's so much more than just those things. There has to be something common that brings us together and not just brings us together but keeps us together in unity. For us as believers, we have one common interest that is above and beyond all other interests. It's the glory of God and the mission of God. The glory of God says this, you were created for the glory of God. Everything that you do, everything that you say, everything that you think and I think and do is meant to glorify God. Now, if you're anything like me, that doesn't happen all the time, but that's the goal. Primarily, that's why we're created. But we're also created for the mission of God, to make disciples of all nations. And when we say we need community to do that, we mean that because that's the picture of the Bible. In Scripture, community to the church is like breath to the human. You absolutely have to have community. You have to have partners in ministry. People spurn you, the Scriptures say, on to love and good deeds. We cannot do this alone, but we also have to understand what community is and what it is not. We've already touched on friendship. Community is not just friendship, that's part of it, but if we just wait to have biblical community with people that we're friends with, primarily, the issue will become we never get to the part of biblical in that community. We just end up having a good time. I'm all about having a good time, trust me. But it has to be about something more. Uh, Community has to be tied to something more to give it purpose, to give it the biblical part of the community, and it's what? The mission of God. We primarily do this through life groups here. It can be done a myriad of ways. That's just one of the ways we do it here. But we have one goal for life groups here. We have one desire. It's not to make people feel welcome. We want you to feel welcome. It's not so you can meet other people. We want you to meet other people. It's not just so that you'll have a place to plug in. We want you to have a place to plug in. The primary goal for life groups here is that we gather a group of believers who can fulfill the mission of God together. Did you catch that? It's not primarily to learn. It's not primarily to eat donuts, which is a good reason nonetheless. Amen, somebody said. I've said a lot of good things, but that gets an amen. It's primarily, listen to me very carefully, to fulfill the mission of God. We see community on almost every page of scripture. But perhaps the best illustration I can think of when it comes to what it looks like to actually have biblical community, what it looks like to be in community is the Trinity. I don't have a ton of time to kind of give us a theology of the Trinity, but nonetheless, the Trinity is a perfect example of community for a purpose. You have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. They are three distinct yet one, but they all have their what? role. They all have their role in fulfilling the mission of God, and they all play a part in that, and they do their role. They do it together so that it fulfills what God wants them to do. John chapter 6, I think, is a great kind of illustration of what this looks like. John chapter 6 and verse um, 38. Listen to this. For I have come, Jesus says, down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus there, in submission to the Father, not subordination, but submission to the Father, is doing that which God has called him to do. God, uh, let's think about it like this. Think about it in salvation, how all three parts of the Trinity work together for the same goal, but in different ways. God, the Father, sent Jesus the Son, right? That was God's part in the planning and the sending, right? God sent his Son. He had the plan. Jesus comes to earth, and what does he do as part of salvation? He dies on the cross, right? 
Jesus dies on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. He atones for our sins. That's what he does. God the Father does that, does not do that. God the Son does that. That's his role. What about the Holy Spirit? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit seals our salvation. He indwells us also, but he seals our salvation. So each of the members of the Trinity have their unique and distinct role, but it's different. What's their aim? Salvation in that particular example. So we look no further than God's own person and persons to understand what does it look like to be in a community, to all have their part and to work that out all for the same mission. We see this in the early church. What you see in Acts chapter 2 is a direct result of the Holy Spirit not just sealing the salvation of believers, but empowering believers. What we see in Acts chapter 2 is this group of people who have just had this incredible experience with the Lord come together, and in their coming togetherness, hear that very carefully, they are doing incredible things. Acts chapter 2, hear this very carefully, is God doing incredible works through a group of people who are unified by one mission. You've often heard me say Indian Springs, and, and I heard someone kind of laugh like one day and say, you probably shouldn't say this as the leader, but we don't have a mission outside of what God has already told us to do. A lot of people spend a lot of money. If you work in the corporate world, you can spend a lot of money on figuring out your mission statement. And I get that. But as a church, we need no mission outside of what God has already told us to do, right? It's like police officers. Police officers don't need a mission statement really beyond serve and protect. That's what you do. So for the church, the Lord has already told us our mission. It's Matthew 28, to make disciples of all nations. So that's what we do. What you see behind me on the panels is just how we work that out. And part of that is in community because as we see Acts chapter 2 is a direct result of Matthew 28, and it's done together. So here's just what I want to give you quickly, because I want us to spend some time demonstrating community together through the Lord's Supper. I want you to see this morning the building blocks of biblical community, because there's probably three different types of people in the room right now, and we all need to be somewhere in this spectrum, and we all need to hear this, but there are those that are currently and actively engaged in biblical community. In this room, you're part of a life group, and it's more than just showing up. You're there, you're engaged. There's another group of you that are kind of halfway in, halfway out. You're not really getting the full effects of it yet. You like it, but you're not really sure you're ready to commit. You're not really sure if you need to commit. Man, then there's others of us that are walking through life as Christians with nobody else. Man, we're just walking through life, and we're struggling, and we need help, but we have no support network around us to help us fulfill the mission of God. If that's you this morning, if you can actively and honestly say, I'm not doing life with anybody. I don't want my words to do anything, but I want the words of Scripture this morning to demonstrate for us how that's just not God's plan for you and I. So let's look at it this morning. I want you to just kind of see quickly kind of three building blocks to biblical community that you and I need to practice so that the whole can practice it together. Number one, uh, building block of community is a devotion to biblical growth. A devotion to biblical growth. Look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. There's kind of four things right there. The apostles' teachings, the fellowship, to breaking of bread, and prayer. That word right there, devoted, I, I think... I think we have to really understand the full ramifications of that. Devoted is more than I do something regularly, right? Like oftentimes we think of, you know, my kid only missed two days of school this whole year. He's really committed to school. And fair enough, he may be. But we oftentimes just think of devoted as something that we do constantly. But that word there, devoted, really has the idea, and the definition is more clearly, something that we're going after with tenacity, Something that we're almost going after fiercely. Something that we're going after with everything that we have. Something that we're really striving for. Kind of sheds light on it's more than just showing up, right? It's, I'm going hard after this. Everything that I have 
is going hard after this. And so for them to have biblical community, they had to, with tenacity, go after what? Well, the apostles' teachings, first and foremost. And I don't think there's any, um, any mistake in how this is ordered. I think it's very clear that they ordered the apostles' teachings first. And by the way, I am not an apostle, so I'm not going to advocate that you hang on every word that I say. But what they're talking about there is the apostles' teaching is Scripture. At this point, they would not have had a Bible in their own hand. They could not have gone down or ordered on Amazon a Bible, so they would have had copies of the Old Testament that they could have looked at, but they had to rely on the apostles to teach them and to tell them everything that Jesus had done and everything that Jesus had said. That's oral tradition in essence, but they hung on that. And when they heard the teachings of Jesus, when they listened to what the Lord expected, it transformed them. Think about that. Bible study is transformative. It's not just informative, but it transformed them to understand who God is, who they are, and what they should do in response to that. So not only did they devote themselves to biblical things, but look what it says there. They, they devoted themselves to fellowship. If you're in this room and you're kind of historically in your life a Baptist, you probably have a really good understanding of what the word fellowship means. Or if you're not a Baptist and perhaps you've watched what Baptists are from afar, you think, hey, they really know what fellowship is. Fellowship is often through the years got this idea of getting together around food. And it can be, don't get me wrong. But fellowship, if we just think of it like that, really undercuts the value of what that word really, really kind of means. In fact, the word fellowship there, it's, it's not really used a lot by the author here, Acts, but when he uses it, he, he's really talking about this idea of kind of, of, of mutual submission to each other for the greater good of each other. Think about that. A mutual kind of submission to each other for the greater good of each other. And that changes everything there. But when we think about fellowship, we aren't just getting together for wings and chili, although we certainly can, but when we are in true fellowship with each other, we are looking out for each other's best interest. And it's, it's mutual, and so there is this oneness about it. John chapter 17, we go back to the Trinity, and we see this picture in John chapter 17 in verse 23. Listen to this. This is one of my favorite Bible verses. It was certainly um, Pastor Tom, one of his favorite Bible verses, if you'll remember, but 17 verse 23 Here's what Jesus says as part of his high priestly prayer. I in them and you in me so that they may become perfectly one. Did you catch that? Perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you have loved me. This idea of mutual submission to each other is much like the Trinity. They understood what each other's role was, but they also understood for the mission of God to be accomplished, they had to do their part. They did that with great tenacity. Look what else. Not just fellowship, but breaking of bread. By the way, that word fellowship right there, I failed to tell you this. That word can also mean communion. To commune with God. Like we're going to take communion here in a second. Commun with communion with God, which makes breaking of bread all the more interesting, right? There's a couple of thoughts on that. This could just mean like regular meals. I think it actually means communion in light of the word fellowship there. I think this is what it's saying is go after tenacity in the, the words of God, the fellowship of the people, but also remembering that which Jesus has done. Because when we take the Lord's Supper, although it's commemorative, we're experiencing together what God has done on our behalf as a community of believers. It's phenomenal. Look at the fourth thing. They devoted themselves to prayers. This could have been a couple of things. This could have been the three Jewish prayers a day. They could have kept that going morning, afternoon, and evening. They could have gone to the temple to do that. I'm not really sure, but the point is this. They practiced together prayers because as a community, they were dependent on who? God. Did you know that's what we're doing when we're praying? That's we're worshiping, sure. But we're, it, we're exclaiming to God our dependence on him, that if he doesn't do it, it won't happen. 
They understood as a community, if we want to continue to see God do incredible things and pick up this note for your own life and for your own family, dads, hear this. Dads, hear this very carefully. They knew that if they wanted God to do something incredible in their community, they needed to ask him to do it. The principle there is, on a side note, man, if I want God to do something in my family, in my work environment, in my house, man, I got to ask God to do it only. He, I got to be dependent on him like the early church. So the first mark of biblical community is a devotion to biblical growth. Number two, I want you to look at this. The second kind of building block or mark of biblical community is a strong commitment to one another. A strong commitment to one another. Look back at the text, verse 44. And all who believed were together. Pause right there. And all who believed. We want to make sure we have a really clear indictment that that this is about biblical community. What is the cornerstone of biblical community? Those who believe. Those who believe were together and they had all things in common. You've probably heard the old joke, and you could really say this about anything, but if you get two Baptists, if you ask two Baptists their opinion, you get three opinions. It's hard sometimes to have all things in common. For instance, you could just walk out to your job tomorrow and start a discussion about politics, and you will have just opened Pandora's box, and you will hear everybody's opinion that you never wanted to. Or you could, today, you could start talking about your favorite football team, or you could talk about how the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl this year, and everybody would run their mouth about how some other team is going to do that, and they would be wrong. So I have the mic, and you don't. I'm just kidding. So when we talk about things like that, does it mean that we have to be this monolithic community? No. It means that when it comes to God, when it comes to things of Scripture, we have to hold those things in common. If we don't have the things of the Bible, if we don't have primary issues together, we have no community Just like if you take the Bible out of whatever we have, we don't have community. doesn't mean you can't hang out. Call it hanging out. But when we are together in biblical community, the teachings and the worship of God is primary, and those in our midst are holding that in common. Not saying you can't have friends that aren't in your biblical community. Not saying you can't have friends that don't agree with you. I'm saying if we're going to call something biblical community that pushes me to love God more, it has to have some standards and it has to have the things in common with God that God said we should. Verse 45, and they were selling all their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all who had need. They had a strong commitment for each other. They weren't going to let each other go hungry. They weren't going to let each other freeze. They weren't going to let each other suffer alone. They weren't going to let each other walk a path by themselves. Let me just tell you what this is not before we move on, because this verse has been abused through the years. This is not a a biblical mandate for like socialism. This is not a biblical mandate for communism. This is not a biblical mandate for any of this. This is explaining what they did. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that the government made them sell their stuff. Out of love for each other and mutual value for each other, they sold their things and they took care of each other. Why? Because they thought of each other more than they thought of themselves. They had this strong commitment to love one another. One of the great themes of Jesus' gospel is, in fact, love one another, do good to one another, help each other. It's this idea of living in biblical community is more so than just having each other's back. It's going that extra mile to make sure everyone around me has exactly what they need to fulfill the mission of God. Always goes back to the mission of God. Let's look at number three. So we talked about how we have this commitment to biblical growth. We have this uh, strong commitment to one another. And then number three, I just want you to see this. We have this kind of a frequency of faithfulness. Catch this. A frequency of faithfulness. Look at it, verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. 
Look at that real quick. And day by day. Things have changed a little bit since the first century. I'll give you that. In the first century, they had more kind of latitude in life to be able to meet every day together. Obviously, it's hard to do that now. In fact, you know, if your schedule's anything like ours, like we maybe are home all together three, four nights a week between practices and all of this, so I get that. So I'm not advocating that you and your life group start meeting every day at your house. What I am advocating is this. Uh, part of the building blocks for them having a strong and unified community is they were committed to it with their time. It's a frequency of faithfulness, right? We have to give our time to those things that are the most important. And for Christians, biblical community is right up there at the top, next to our salvation in Jesus Christ, because community is inseparable, or inseparable rather, from what? Mission. And so we have to ensure that we are doing this frequently. When I was a kid, when we started going to church, this may be your experience, so you're welcome to shout if it is. Um, when the doors were opened, we were there. When we started going to church, I mean, we went to Sunday night church. Some of you have never heard of Sunday night church. We went to Sunday night church. We went to Sunday morning church. We went to Wednesday night church. If there was some kind of church on Thursday night, we were there. And that was good, don't get me wrong. But even then, that's not the idea of day by day. Because what happens is when we just see things as checking the box, because that's what you're supposed to do, it becomes antithetical to community. I dread being here. But what we see in Acts chapter 2 is they gathered day by day and with frequency because they needed each other. Let's do this real quick. You don't have to say anything. I'm not going to make this weird. No promises. Look to your left. Look to your right. Okay, you can look back here now. Some of you are against the wall. You weren't really sure what to do. You need those people. You absolutely need those. You, you may not think we do. We absolutely need those people in our lives because they are helping hold us accountable. It's very hard to hold ourselves accountable. We need people speaking into our lives the things that we struggle with. Your coworkers aren't going to do it. Your friends on the baseball team aren't going to do it. We need somebody looking at us and saying, hey, Matt, man, you're struggling with this. Let me just help you out here. Let me pray with you. Man, we need somebody that sees the, the shortcomings in our lives and helps us correct it. We need someone that sees the victories in our lives and celebrates it with us. But we cannot do that from afar. We have to do that in these intimate relationships, and it has to be frequent. There is something to gathering with a group of people who have one mission and one goal frequently that helps us personally fulfill our daily goal of glorifying God and making disciples there's a guy that wrote a book several years ago called Church is a Team Sport. It's a pretty good book. You can pick it up. But the whole gist of it is this, is we are all in this together. God has given the Great Commission. The Lord has given the Great Commission to the church via the individuals. And we all have our own gifts and our own roles that we have to do. And if we're going to see God do something incredible as he's done in, in decades and millennia past, we as a church have to come together in community putting all of the things aside and saying it's God's mission, it's God's priority that is first. How do we do that? Through a strong commitment to biblical growth, a strong commitment to loving each other, and a frequency of faithfulness. Meeting together, loving each other, pouring into each other, Asking each other, helping each other. We get to the point where I really don't want anybody to know what's going on in my life to I need these people if I'm going to do exactly what God is going or wants me to do. Let me ask you this. Where are you at on the spectrum? You're either all in and you're there. Matt, I, everything you've said, I've already figured it out. This was good, but thank you. So if that's you, Maybe you need to help somebody else who's in that second category, who's kind of halfway in. I mean, they come to life group or whatever, discipleship group, whatever their, their community is, they come to it because they're kind of supposed to, but 
they're not really sharing their lives. You know, they're struggling, but they won't open. Maybe you need to reach out to them, be a person of peace for them. Maybe you're in that second group, and you're like, man, I just, I, I come to worship, is that enough? Let me just lovingly, listen, this is as loving as I can make this, and just tell you this, it's not. As good as this is, and you need to be in worship, don't get me wrong, this is not, a biblical community in the sense of we're not going to go around and ask how we can hold each other accountable. We probably don't need to do that in this larger setting, especially with the cameras going, right? Uh, this isn't somewhere where we can all challenge each other and love each other and encourage each other. We've got to be in that, man. We've got to be in that place where we're growing. If we want to find growth, we get with other people who love God, love the mission of God, and help us grow. Or maybe you're the third type. You have no idea what this is. You grew up in church, maybe... You went to a Sunday school, and it was just kind of basically someone talking for an hour. Or you've been in other things where, you know, it, we had great fellowship, but we had no kind of biblical element to that. Look, I, I don't know where you are on the spectrum, but he, here's what I know for a fact. You ready? You know where you're on the spectrum. So here in a second, when I pray, maybe you just need to ask the Lord where you are. God, help me see where I'm at and help me get past any preconceived notions, any pride issues. God, help me experience life as you intend it to be experienced. Help me live my Christian faith out like it is demonstrated in the Trinity with submission to my brothers and sisters for the greater good and the goal and the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is for you. Or maybe this. Maybe you've, you've been visiting, you're ready to kind of join a group, whatever it is. If that's you today, man, after this, don't leave. We'll be at the Connect Desk. We want to help get you plugged into a community because here's what I know. We need it. We were created for it, and the mission of God thrives through it.